Auburn, New York, 1981. Summer is winding down, it's the last hot weekend of the year, and an 18-year-old young woman is planning a night of drinking and celebrating with her close group of friends. Eighteen months later, her family and community have their worst fears confirmed when her decomposing body is discovered accidentally by a college student in a remote wildlife refuge. I'm Art Intel, and this is the very strange case of Julie Munson's murder. September 26, 1981. Julie Monson is an 18-year-old, intelligent, attractive young woman who was enrolled and just started the fall semester at Cuyahoga Community College in her local hometown of Auburn, New York. She's excited about her future, and even more excited about the Saturday night ahead she has planned with her closest friends. The group starts out at Wegmans, where they buy some beer for the night ahead. They plan to drink and bar hop from spot to spot around the small town. As the evening winds down, they find themselves at the Stockade, a local tavern on Grand Avenue. It's a little after 2 a.m., and Julie's friends report seeing her drive off up Prospect Street in her parents' red Chevette, never to be seen again alive by any of them. Her friends were not the last ones to see her alive, though. Witnesses reported seeing Julie pulled over on the side of the road on Prospect Street shortly after leaving the stockade and talking with what they described as a dark-haired man with a green Cordoba. The witnesses say they saw the man looking under the hood of her car briefly, saw them talking for some time, and then saw them both get into his car and drive off. It was about 2.30 a.m. The next day, Julie's parents reported her missing and a manhunt was underway. Her locked car was found abandoned on Prospect Street where the witnesses reported the man looking under the hood, but investigators found the car to be working just fine when they tested it. The keys to the car were found later on the front lawn of a home some distance from the scene. For the moment, however, nothing else explained what happened to Julie Munson. The three witnesses who later reported seeing the man insisted that he had stopped Julie and convinced her something was wrong with her car and that the two then drove off together in his car. The identity of this man, however, remains an unconfirmed mystery to this day. What the witnesses report seeing becomes a major point of contention later in the case, pointing it in different directions toward different suspects. He is reported as being large with dark hair. He appeared to be much taller and bigger than Julie in stature, and the two drove off together in what the witnesses report as a green Cordova. Investigators had a profile of a man, but no face. Despite this profile, evidence would end up taking the case in what would appear to be contradictory paths. The twists and turns that follow are truly bizarre. Reward money was offered and leads were followed. Special investigations were started, and the state police soon got involved in the case. In April of the next year, Julie's wallet and ID were found along a road near Cuyahoga Lake State Park. The property owner where the items were found confirms they could not have been dropped there and left for six months. They must have been placed there within the last two weeks. This marks the first clear evidence in the case Julie has indeed met with foul play. Investigators had no physical evidence of what happened to Julie, no body, and little to go on. They needed a break and got one in May of 1982 when an ex-boyfriend of Julie started talking about the case. In a conversation with John Bazarnik, he reportedly bragged about killing Julie because she would not have sex with him that night. The investigators had their first real possible suspect. Thomas Bianco and Julie had dated in high school for a very brief time. The two broke up after only two weeks, and according to classmates, it had a profound and noticeable impact on Thomas Bianco at the time. John Bazarnik was a close friend of Bianco's, close enough that Bianco felt comfortable opening up to him about what happened to Julie Munson the night she disappeared. He claimed that he waved Julie down, convinced her she had a car problem, talked her into his car, and then tried to rape her. When she tried to get away, he caught her and hit her in the head. 
He then claimed to have given her body to another man he didn't know if he had met in Cuyahoga State Park, and then he went home. Bianco talked to another friend later that summer about the murder as well. Thomas Palacevetta reported to investigators that Bianco had admitted to him that he had murdered Julie as well. This time, Bianco included additional details about her death as well, stating that he had stabbed Julie multiple times. Later, Bianco's girlfriend recalled telling him where Julie's body was, long before it had ever been discovered at the Montezuma Wildlife Refuge. He had also bragged to friends in Florida about the crime, reportedly telling them, I'm not stupid, I raped her first. Things looked bad for Thomas Bianco. But as the prosecutors were gathering evidence against him, a new character stepped into the story to shake things up. James Vassilet was an avid video buff who claimed to be investigating the Munson murder on his own. He claimed to have admissions from those involved in the case and also had everything videotaped about the case. Vassile was also one of the witnesses to testify that Bianco had admitted to the murder. His friend, Joseph DeVoe, noted how obsessed Vassile was with the case. He even thought his phone was tapped because of what he knew. In October of 1982, over a year after Julie was reported missing, James Vassile, driving a tow truck, tried to force another car off the road. When police approach him about the incident, he points a gun at them. Later in November, police approach him again about another incident, and he flees in his car, leading police on a high-speed chase before being arrested. He's arrested again in December for aggravated harassment, and in January, he's admitted for evaluation to the Hutchings Psychiatric Center in Syracuse. James threatened to get people he thought made incriminating statements in the Munson case. Two years later, James Vassile reportedly committed suicide. After calling to talk to his ex-wife at a battered woman's shelter, he threatened suicide if she wouldn't come to the phone. When she didn't come, a nurse on the other end reported hearing a loud bang and then only the sound of the TV on the other end of the line. She called the police, but they never entered Vassile's home. Instead, it was James DeVoe that found him dead the next day, with the phone still in his hand and a rifle nearby. Among the many rumors presented in this case, there is the allegation from Mark Sweeting that Thomas Calasaveta had told him that he, Vassile, and another man, John Corning, had raped Munson and videotaped it at Vassile's house. The story also explains that Julie broke her leg when she tried to escape from the car, a detail that would lend credibility to the story later. After she broke her leg, the men reportedly killed her and buried her under Vassile's shed before moving her body at a later time. For his part, DeVoe never believed that James killed himself. He believed it could have been an accident, however, as the gun had a hair trigger. What adds some credibility to the story is the broken leg, which coroners reportedly found when her body was ultimately discovered. Another fact that adds weight to the story is that John Corning, the third man named in the plot, is the son of a prominent county judge. From all accounts, John Corning lived a charmed life. His father was an FBI agent turned district attorney who ultimately ascended to become the county's top judge. He was a popular football star. In fact, played in the game the night before Julie's disappearance. He scored three touchdowns in that game and ran for over 120 yards. So why would anyone believe that he would be involved in the murder of Julie Munson? According to the Corning family, John was never really a suspect. They say that a call from Bianca's attorney is what began the misinformation campaign. Bianca's attorney, William Lynn, was calling the Cornings to warn them about the rumors and to ask them to request that the DA hold off on arresting Bianca for a few days, believing that doing so would give the suspect time to consider telling the authorities where he disposed of the body. It was not in fact until 1991 that Bianca would formally make the accusation that John Corning was involved. Peter Corning would call the accusations against his son an attack against the family. But John Corning did have several run-ins with the law. He was arrested for open container violations and assaulting police officers. He had filed a complaint with the FBI, in fact, claiming his civil rights had been violated during this time. 
in 1988, he was in a bar fight when he showed up at a bar with another man's ex-girlfriend. Later, in 2004, Corny was sentenced to probation for being involved in a large-scale drug trafficking operation. He pleaded guilty to fourth-degree criminal conspiracy and later went to jail for violating his probation in 2006. Could John Corning really have been involved in the murder of Julie Munson? In January of 1983, David Weinstein, attorney for Thomas Calasabetta, gets a call from a woman named Mary Catherine Wilson. She is the ex-girlfriend of Thomas Bianco, and as mentioned earlier, had information about the whereabouts of the body of Julie Munson. While visiting the Montezuma Wildlife Refuge, Bianco reportedly tells her where he disposed of her. Weinstein immediately tells the police about this and a search is conducted of the area. Nothing is found, however, and Julie's whereabouts are still a mystery. That is until four months later, on April 7, 1983, a college student named Pamela Decker is taking soil samples as part of a research project when she stumbles upon the remains of Julie Monson. The discovery ends 18 months of suffering for the family and community and leads investigators to pin several suspects for the murder. Julie is buried in a private service days later, but the cause of death remains undisclosed to the public. By February of 1984, the police had focused their attention on one suspect, Thomas Bianco. Prosecutors began presenting evidence to the grand jury later that year, and in July of 1985, Thomas Bianco is charged with the abduction, murder, and sexual assault of Julia Munson. The indictment states Munson was struck with an automobile, choked, and stabbed. William Lynn, defense attorney for Thomas Bianco, begins requesting and gathering the evidence against his client for trial at the time. Acquiring everything from the prosecution proved a difficult task for Lynn and set off another complication for the prosecution. The American justice system requires the prosecution to turn over all evidence they discover during the course of an investigation, not just the evidence that's damaging to the defendant. Not doing so violates the defendant's civil rights and would have a profound impact on the ultimate outcome of this case. During the discovery process, three judges removed themselves from the case. State Supreme Court Judge D. Crew would ultimately preside over the trial which began jury selection in February of 1986. In March, the evidence was presented by both sides and the jury had reached a verdict in the case. Guilty. Bianco was sentenced to 25 years to life and began serving his sentence in May. Later that month, Bianco's other attorney, Joseph Fahey, discovers that the prosecution has failed to disclose evidence it has uncovered about other suspects in the case and demands a new trial for his quiet. Also in March of that same year, Thomas Calasatera recanted his testimony against Bianco and claimed he had lied to the grand jury. In April, a lower court released Thomas Bianco from prison and the convicted killer is freed again back into the public. This would be the first time Thomas Bianco was imprisoned and released. His freedom would be short-lived as in November of that same year, the second highest court in the state reversed the decision of the lower court and reaffirmed the guilty conviction. The court rationalized that while the evidence was withheld from the defense, it was not significant enough to overturn the jury's verdict. Following the decision, defense appealed to the state's highest courts who refused to hear the appeal. In January of 1993, however, defense attorney Joseph Fahey announced that there was new information that had recently surfaced that would prove his client's innocence. He files another appeal, alleging that Calasabetta was coerced into giving his testimony. Finally, after numerous appeals, Broome County Judge Patrick Montserrat was persuaded by the defense argument and threw out the conviction of Thomas Bianco. The judge states that Bianco never got a fair trial, but he leaves the grand jury indictment in place. This forces the new DA, James Vargason, to either appeal the decision of Judge Montserrat or retry Thomas Bianco. His appeal is never heard, and no new trial is ever rescheduled. Bianco is once again set free, this time for good. Judge Montserrat determined in the case that former District Attorney Paul Garbanaro, who had tried the case, 
had purposely withheld 30 lines from police reports turned over to the defense before the trial. These 30 lines mentioned another man, ex-convict John Grossman, and pointed to him as the actual murderer. District Attorney James Vargason, who never retried the case against Bianco, also never explained why he believed so firmly that Grossman was the actual perpetrator. What is known is that Grossman refused to answer any questions about the case and that he does have a very violent past. At the time Julie was murdered, Grossman was out of prison after serving a term for first-degree assault. Three years after the murder, he was once again convicted of violently raping a 16-year-old girl. Grossman was paroled in 2010, and to date, no one else has been charged in the murder of Julie Monson. As far as the original DA is concerned, the evidence in the case still points to Thomas Bianco as the most likely suspect. The testimony from those who knew him is what's most damaging. The community of Auburn, however, doubted Bianco's guilt long before his conviction was overturned. The reliance of the DA on the testimony of Thomas Calesa Beta is what most people found troubling. That and Bianco not being present at the bar or anywhere else that night gives them pause, along with the fact that Bianco drove a Skylar, not a Cordoba. The forensics were not clear either in the case. Pathologists determined that the broken leg was actually more likely the result of an animal chewing on it after she died. The bra she was wearing had no stab wounds and there was no blood on it either. So what about John Grossman, the ex-con? Grossman, a large menacing man, matched the build of the description witnesses gave that night. They noted that the man they saw was much taller than Julie, who was even in heels at the time. That would not fit the description of Bianco, who was about the same height or even smaller than Julie, especially if she was wearing heels. The car seen that night also more closely matched what Grossman was driving at the time versus the car Bianco had. The color of the car as well can more easily be confused for the color of the car Grossman was driving versus that of Bianco. But why would Thomas Bianco repeatedly lie about committing the crime? And how would he know to tell his girlfriend that she was disposed of in the Montezuma Wildlife Refuge before she was found? Lastly, there is the tragic party theory to consider. The theory holds that Thomas Bianco picked up Julie that night and brought her to a party at the home of Judge Peter Corning. She later left the party with John Corning, Thomas Calesa Beta, and James Vasily. The four went to Vasily's house where the men raped Monson in front of a video camera. The group then left Vasily's house and went driving on Old Country Line Road where Julie leaped from the car and broke her leg. She tried to run away but was tackled by Corning and Vasily and stabbed repeatedly until she was dead. Her body was then brought back to Vasile's home and buried under his shed, before later being moved to the Montezuma Wildlife Refuge. This story originates from Mark Sweeting, who claims that Thomas Calesa Beta told him this story while they served time together. Another convict, Ricky Lee Winters, backed up the story claiming he heard the over-conversation himself as well. Ricky Lee Winters, however, was convicted by Judge Corning and his statement may well simply be a ploy to get back at the judge. This story has a lot more intrigue, however, as Sweeney points the finger at the highest levels of power in the county's justice system, and there was some evidence presented at trial that backed his story. An FBI agent reported finding soil samples on the body that could not have come from the wildlife refuge, pointing to the body having been moved before and buried elsewhere plausibly under Vasile's shed. The death of James Vasile adds intrigue to the story as well. Vasile had testified before the grand jury and later died of a gunshot wound to the stomach. While the ruling of his death was a suicide, many in his family believe he was murdered to keep him from revealing the truth behind Julie's disappearance and the murder in September of 1981. The case of Julie Munson remains unsolved to this day, but not because there have been no suspects, interviews, arrests, or even convictions. The bizarre circumstances and facts surrounding this tragic event still have many in the Auburn community debating about who was actually responsible for her murder. All of them agree, however, that the killer needs to be brought to justice. What do you think? Is Thomas Bianco, who was convicted of the crime, the actual killer? Is John Grossman, the ex-con with a violent past and matching description, the predator? 
Or is it possible that Julie was a victim of a plot orchestrated and covered up by very powerful people in the community? Let me know what you think in the comments below. If you have further information regarding this case, please comment as well. All references are available in the description of the video. Thanks for watching. Please like the video and consider subscribing if you enjoyed it.